and a big hello to every hard working ca inter student gearing up towards the november 23 exam i'm sure you're doing really really well a little tensed maybe this video will help reduce the tension a little bit my name is saurav mutha and i'm bringing to you all the amendments that are applicable to november 24 in tax whether it is income tax or whether it is gst this video is going to solve all your amendment issues i made a really summary short video so you can revise it really often and I, in the description i have also attached the link to the summary sheets so you can watch these sheets or read these sheets by yourself as well so all the best guys watch this video till the end to know about all the amendments and remember just like we wear new clothes or just like we drive that new car or use that new phone icai also uses new amendments to be asked in the exam so read this the best time to do this is after you finish all the portion so finish all your portion without worrying about the amendments then watch this amendment video and revise whenever you want to so here we go we're starting off with dt amendments and then we will move on to gst amendments so here you go this is dt amendments and as a special surprise i've not just limited myself to uh, the amendments of finance act 2022 but i also of the last two years because even they could be asked in the exam so you might be aware of a lot of these amendments if you're not then wait here you go the finance act 2022 is the one which is applicable to your exam yes you heard it right november 23 exams the finance act 23 does not apply so which finance act applies it's the finance act 2022 so this amendment mainly covers those finance act amendments and also some other important amendments that have ha happened recently one of the things is guys the ulips unit linked insurance plans wherever they are in the ca inter portion now please remove it so don't get confused with any discussion around ca inter uh, around ulips next in residential status you already know there are two amendments one is called deemed resident section 61a and there's another amendment for both our shortcut is aic i'll tell you how this amendment works and what how is it supposed to be used in the exam you will use the amendment only i'm giving a pro tip only when two conditions are satisfied first if your person is a non resident that means you figured out the residential status basic condition 1 basic condition 2 etc and he's turning out to be a non resident and his indian income is more than 15 lakhs only then you will check for this amendment otherwise don't even think about this amendment now what is this amendment the first one 61a as you already know is aic this is applicable only to indian citizens yes that means you have a indian passport your indian income should be more than 1 lakhs that's i income and the condition is that you should not be taxed as a resident in any country of the world and if that happens india says you are my indian citizen a rich indian citizen and you're not being taxed anywhere in the country so i will tax you but as a r n o r so this amendment shifts you from an n r to an r n o r that's the intention this is called 61a this is deemed resident because you're actually not a resident you're a non resident but we make you a non resident sorry an r n o r by this amendment that's the first one the second amendment which i call is aic c2 is also applicable to indian citizens but also applicable to pios persons of indian origin mm -hmm. whose parents or grandparents were born in india next year also you should be rich that means your indian income should be more than 15 lakhs so these both have to be fulfilled and the third condition which needs to be fulfilled is basic condition 2 which generally we would not ask you because you are indian citizen or a pio visiting india we would not ask you basic condition 2 but now this one because you are rich we will ask basic condition 2 where stay in india should be greater than or equal to 60 days and in the last 4 years should be greater than or equal to 365 days but they've changed 60 days to 120 days so basically this condition is only when you satisfy 120 days and 365 days if you satisfy all these three conditions then from a nr you suddenly become an r n o r so the idea of both these amendments is the same they want more non residents to become r n o r next while calculating indian income here indian income is the same as dear plus one income that's the change in residential status let's move ahead in salary chapter yes you are a slave you are an employee and you get interest on your statutory provident fund recognized provident fund provident public provident etc and if the interest is more than 2.5 lakh rupees so yes you are getting interest on in all these amounts which is great but if the amount is so big that your interest is 3 lakhs then up to 2.5 lakh the government will exempt but above that they will tax you <clears throat> so how can this be asked in the exam if in the exam they say that mr a has earned interest from his rpf account of 2 lakh 70000 then 2 lakh 50 will be exempt but the 20000 ahead will be taxable earlier up to 9.5% was exempt no limit but now they limited it 2.5 lakhs because understand the government can't exempt you for such huge amounts example if i have 1 crore rupees in my rpf account 
then one crore and let's say the rate of interest is seven percent so i earn seven lakh rupees the government can't exempt so much so they say only up to 2.5 that's the amendment in incomes on salaries let's go to pgpp pgpp a very very small amendment which is not important this happened in the year 2019 to 20 and hence it is not important guys don't get too bothered by this amendment in that year the sales of motor vehicles had dropped very low so hence the government has said that if anyone bought a motor vehicle between 28th august 23rd august to 31st march that is in the middle of the year to 31st march then generally the rate of depreciation is 15% but we'll give you 30% and for buses and trucks we'll give you 45% this was given as an encouragement to encourage motor vehicle companies next in rule 6d re remember you can't pay more than 10000 rupees cash in business if you do the entire thing is disallowed similarly for gta you cannot pay you cannot pay more than 35000 but they had a exception list rule 6d d where they said that if it's a holiday or a strike day then you can pay but that has been removed guys right? some of these amendments you would already know because i'm covering all three years past three years amendments next guys nice. you are a businessman but you are someone who is into construction or a builder like uh, lodha builders kalpataru builders prestige builders etc and whenever you are selling land and building you compare your sale consideration with the stamp duty value if you remember this discussion you take the sale consideration and you multiply into 110% and let's say your sale consideration is 60 lakh into 110% is 66 lakh and if your stamp duty value is above that then they will take the stamp duty value because they want a higher sale consideration now why am i talking about this this is something that you already know i'm talking about this because earlier it was 105% now it's become 110% most of you again will know this because this is from a prior amendment sheet so now the percentage is 10% whether it's here whether it's in capital gains or whether it's in ifos next 44 ab yes you heard it right audit the books that means you're a big fish big fish is someone who has to go to a ca after the year ends and get his books of accounts audited how do you become a big fish as a professional if your turnover is more than 50 lakh and as a businessman if your turnover is more than 1 crore if you remember that now the big fish definition has changed Of course, that one crore limit is still there, but they put a new limit of ten crores. Yes, you heard it right. That means, as a businessman, up to ten crores, you will not have to go to a CA. But who does this limit apply to? This limit only applies if your cash receipts and your cash payments both are very low. So they are saying that one crore limit still applies. Yes, the ten crore limit is given only to those people who have very low cash transaction. How low? Up to five percent each. the cash receipts divided by total receipts is also 5% and cash payments up divided by total payments is also up to 5% so 22% great 33% great 34% great but 5 and 7% not good because both should be up to 5% only then you will get the higher limit of 10 crores only after that you will be subject to an audit next guys till now you had understood that land is never depreciated we made make memes and jokes about it but now the memes and jokes will be also on goodwill because from today onwards goodwill or from this exam attempt onwards goodwill is also not to be depreciated next 44 ad remember presumptive tax which applied to a businessman and professional this professional ones now does not include hufs so only individual and partnership firms can take this presumptive scheme next 44 as that is arrange accounts this arranging accounts you can maintain them in electronic form or physical form which is very basic not an important amendment let's move ahead to capital gains guys for your year the previous year is 22 23 and the cii of that year whenever you want to do indexation is 331 just keep that in mind in case of land and building acquired before 14 2001 guys this is old fashioned if you remember any asset bought before 14 2001 in place of the cost you can take the original cost or the fmv as on 14 2001 if you remember whichever is higher which was great but they said that in case of land and building you can take higher of these two but you will subject to a ceiling of stamp duty value example if you are selling a land and building and the original cost was 5 lakh and the fair market value is 7 lakh you can take 7 lakhs but if the stamp duty value is 6 lakh you will limit it to 6 lakh if the stamp duty value is 8 lakh then 7 lakh is no problem this is only when you are doing land and building costing moving ahead to the next one <laughs> i'm sorry moving ahead to the next one guys here is section 50b slum sale if you remember britannia that means i am not selling my entire undertaking or entire company sorry i am just selling one part of my company that is an undertaking when i sell that then there is capital gains under section 50b this is called slum sale i hope you remember this 
Now there is a concept here. There was ATPSC, that means five letters which you use in capital gain. Is there an asset we are selling? Yes. Is there selling an under undertaking? Are we selling it? Yes. What is the period of holding? If it's more than three years, all this is not changing, guys. Cost is the net worth. Everything remains the same. Only thing, sale price. Now, you know, sale price can be manipulated. I'm selling the undertaking of 50 crores, but I can take 30 crores in cash. Hence, the government says, sale consideration is now A or B, whichever is higher. A is whatever you are saying. And B is the fair market value of the assets. Whichever is higher will be the sale consideration. This is the amendment in capital gains. Remember, 50B can be a good question in the exam. Now, IFOS. All small, small, small incomes go in IFOS. Example, dividend income. And the next one is about dividend income. Guys, for dividend income, you sit at home, you get dividend income, you're happy about it. Can you minus any deductions? Generally not, because there's no expense to earn that dividend income. But now they've allowed it. They said that you have any interest in relation to that income. How? Let me explain. You've taken a loan. From that loan, you bought shares. From that shares, you earned dividends. So is that loan linked? Yes. Then you can minus interest, but only up to 20% of such dividend income. So that is an uh, amendment that dividend income can have a deduction of interest up to 20%. Moving ahead, very, very important, very new COVID treatment. Guys, someone paid you money for COVID treatment. Of course, it can be considered as a gift because it is money and it is more than 50,000. But the government has said that if it's COVID money, that means received for COVID treatment, then they will not tax it. This is basically will not be subject to gift tax. Further, unfortunately, if the person is no more and someone pays money, then example, he, that person who's no more used to work with Tata Steel and Tata Steel decided to pay money. Again, there is no tax on that, provided the money is received within 12 months of the death. Here, if the money is received from the employer, there is no limit. But if the money is received from anyone else, the limit is up to 10 lakh rupees. You have to have all the documentation, etc. The person died of COVID. Uh, all those details you should have. This is COVID. This could be asked either the hospitalization or the death amount. Next, in deduction under Chapter 6, is, this is something that you should know or you will know because it's already there in your books. That is ATGGA. When you're giving money around, for things like scientific research, etc. When you're donating money, then in this case, cash payment up to 2000 is allowed. About 2000 will be fully disallowed. Next is TDS, TCS, advanced tax. Very, very important. The first one is something that you know. 194, the company is paying dividend. If the dividend is more than 5000, there will be TDS at the rate of 10%. But remember, if there is cash dividend, then there is no limit here. That is section 194. Next, uh, turnover of cooperative society. If the cooperative society is big, that is more than 50 crore. In the last year, the TDS of interest paid would be 10%. If the interest is more than 40,000, 50,000 in case of senior citizen. So example, you deposit money in a cooperative society, which is a big cooperative society. The turnover last year is more than 50 crore. Then the same limits applicable to a bank will apply to them. Next is 194O. Remember selling online. When you sell online, example, this is you selling online through Zomato. Then Zomato, while they are paying, you will deduct 1% and pay to the government. That is section 194O, that is online. Here, the only reason I'm putting here is the if you don't give your PAN number here, the 1% will not become 20%, it will become 5%. This most of you would already know. Next, guys, 206AB and 206CC, CCA. These are two punishment sections. If you can't remember the section, not very important, but just remember the context. People, the government wants to punish those people who don't file their return. So here they said that if in the last year you not filed a return and your TDS has to be uh, is already more than 50,000 rupees. Example, last year you did not file a return saying that my income is very low. But someone deducted TDS or some people deducted TDS of more than 50,000 in your case, then TDS is basically on income. So you should have filed your return. And hence here the government will punish you. They will tax you. Whatever TDS is supposed to be deducted, they will deduct it at twice the rate or 5%, whichever is higher. Is there a punishment? Yes, for not filing the return in the last year. And same thing for TCS also. Year also, it's double the rate or 5%, whichever. This is when you don't file the return in the last year. Next, if you don't quote your PAN, there's a penalty of 10,000. I don't think this is important because penalty the chapter is only waiting for you at CA final. 194 cube we've discussed, guys. This is quantity. When you're a seller and you're selling in high quantity and you're a buyer and you're buying in high quantity, Example, this is TDS. So TDS, always the payer or the buyer in the middle. 
and he is buying in huge quantity or he is paying in huge quantity that is buying more than 50 lakh rupees and his last year's turnover is more than 10 crores then whenever he is paying he has to deduct TDS at the rate of 0.1% and pay to the government. Now this TDS is basically only on the excess above 50,000. Most of this you will know already. And remember if 194Q applies then similar section 2061H which is high value will not apply because Q is on receipt of payment whichever is earlier. So the government feels this is better. If you can't understand the logic, just remember if both apply, 194Q will take precedence. And if all three apply, even 194O will apply, then O will take the highest precedence because guys, the rate is higher 1%. The government obviously is like us only, they want more money. Next, 194P, you know this already. This is basically for retired people, pensioners, where this age is 75 years or more, and they have two income, pension income and interest income in the same bank account. Then the bank has to determine their TDS and not deduct TDS at 10%, which is generally deducted by banks. Next is 194R. This has already been asked in the question paper in May 22. Now, what May 23? Now, what is this section 194R? The shortcut is reels. Here, let's say I'm an influencer and I make reels about hotels, etc. And this is Taj Hotels, and they are giving me a free stay in one of the Taj Hotels in Maldives. Now, a lot of these benefits we used to go to people who were doing business and profession. And the shortcut is our reels. This is for influencers, basically. The government says, listen, Taj Hotels, if the benefit you're giving to a person is more than 20,000 in the year, up to 20,000, no problem. But if it's more than 20,000 benefit in cash or in kind, you need to deduct now because it's their income. You need to deduct TDS at 10%. Whatever you pay, whether it's cash, whether it's kind, whether it's capital asset, you need to deduct the TDS. And you need to do this before you pay that person. But don't worry, if you give him a mobile phone to review and he gives it back to you, then in that case, there is no TDS. That is what the definition is. And here, this does not apply if Taj is a small individual, small HUF. If you remember, what is small individual, small HUF? Small individual, small HUF is that guy whose last year's turnover, not this year, last year's turnover. This is only a shortcut, guys, whose last year's turnover is up to 50 lakh in business. No, sorry, in profession or up to 1 crore in business. Next, 2061G, that is global. If you remember the shortcut here, when you are taking foreign exchange, there will be a TCS. Uh, but this TCS does not apply to non-residents. That's what the are saying here. Next, we come to the last chapter already, which is return of income. Only that chapter is left and all DT amendments are covered. In return of income, the due date for audit assesses has been extended from 30th September to 31st October. Most of us will already know this. Some of you guys, article chip students, have already done this. Next, due date for filing... Uh, Partnership firm. If the partnership firm is a big fish, that means if they are due date is 31st October, then all partners, whether they're sleeping partners, active partners, all have the due dates will be 31st October only. Next, due date for filing belated returns. Belated means late. Can you file your return late? Yes, you can. Or you can also revise your return, but you cannot do this forever. You can now do this only in the assessment year by 31st December. So your year is 22-23 exam year. So in the assessment year 23-24, you can only do all this by 31st December. Next, 234F, the fees for late filing. If you file your return late, that is beyond July, October, November, the shortcut is John, then you will have to pay a fee of 5,000 per return. However, if you are not very rich, if your income is up to 5 lakh, then this is only up to 1,000 per return. Next, any person should have a PAN and RR and they should be linked to each other. Otherwise, there is a penalty under section 234H, which you already have in your notes. Uh, next, this rule is not important. This for PAN and RR. But very, very important is this updated return. I'll talk about this in slightly more detail. Now, what is an updated return? Guys, your year, previous year was 22, 23 and it is now over. Whether you filed your return on time or late return or belated return, etc. doesn't matter. But things have now moved on. Now, if this is the assessment year. The assessment year is 23, 24. In this year, you could have filed your return, revised it, etc. by 31st December. Maybe you haven't done that. But in the later years, guys, you realize some mistake of yours. Let's say you did not include 10 lakh worth of income and that you realize later. Then the government gives you an option here to file an updated return of income. But the government is very, very, very smart here. Updated return can be filed only if it benefits the government, does not benefit you. That means the updated return should not be to reduce the income. It should not be to increase the loss. It should not be to increase the refund. Anything that benefits you, you cannot put in the updated return. Then why will someone file an updated return? Is to be clean so that tomorrow when you're caught, you're not penalized. So they say an updated return can be filed up to 24 months after the assessment year. Yes, you heard right. So we have a good window to file an updated return. The updated return can be filed only if you're increasing the income. 
or if there is a loss which you are turning into income or reducing, basically something that is benefiting the government. That you can file and here whenever you file example, you tell the government that listen in my PGBP, I should have told, uh, showed 10 lakh rupees more and I forgot. Then in that case, you will have to pay a normal tax, obviously. You will have to pay interest also, obviously. But on top of that, you will have to pay 25% extra if this updated return is filed within 12 months. And if it's for, filed within 24 months, that is after 12 months, then this is 50%. So do I have to file the normal tax and interest? Yes. Plus I have to file 25 or 50% extra. This is the updated return. Remember, updated return cannot be filed if the assessment has already been completed, is already pending. You can only file it. There's no assessment going on of that year. And this is basically like a confession. In church, we go and confess to the father or to the priest. Here also, we are confessing to the government within 12 or 24 months after the assessment year is over. This is basically the updated return. 25% of the aggregate tax and interest payable if the return is furnished after the expiry of 12 months. So 12 months are from the expiry. And if it's 24 months or after 12 months, but before 24 months, then it's 50% of the tax and interest has to be paid. And there's a section 115 BSC, which we have discussed in class in detail, has been introduced in one of these financial amendments or finance amendments act. This is the DT amendment. Watch this amendment and then move to GST amendments in the same way. I have summarized all the GST amendments in one page. Watch it. All the best. Hello, hello and hello again. GST amendments is on the menu this time. So if you're looking at completing your GST portion, but you're scared whether you've covered all the amendments, then watch this video because this video is covering all GMST amendments applicable for November 23 exam CA inter. So my name is Saurabh Mutha and let's begin. This is a summary video. This is a summary version of the video. And this one covers everything that you need to know. So here we go. Also in the description, I'm going to be attaching this sheet, which you can use to actually summarize the GST amendments for CA Inter November. As, as you know, the CA Inter November exam, 23 exam is based on the Finance Act 2022. Yes, you heard it right, the last Finance Act. And all the amendments up to April 23, 30th April have been covered and they've been covered here as well. Let's start from the first one. I've just summarized all of them. These are all here. Don't worry, the number had look too many, but most of them you already have covered in class. Whether you are taking class from me or anyone else, you've covered most of them already. First of all, if you remember GST compensation says assess which is applicable only on sin and demerit goods, etc. And to help the uh, make make uh, help uh, the states in the case of shortfall, that GST compensation says was initially only for five years, but that has been extended for another five years. That's the first amendment, not really very important. Whichever I marked in blue are exempt. Purpose is provided in terms of contractual agreement to employees. What is this? I'm working in a company. And as part of my employment contract, I got a lot of perquisites, a house, a car, etc. All those because they're connected to my employment, there is no GST. It has been exempted. This is the line. It's a part of Schedule 3, which also uh, ex uh, says that non-taxable salary will be non-taxable. Similarly, these payments are linked to salary and hence these are also non-taxable. The next one. Liquidate the damages, penalty, etc. Guys, you ride your bike, you break a signal and a cop catches you. Do you have to pay a penalty? Yes. On that, is there GST? No, because there is no quid pro quo. You don't break the signal so that you can, you know, pay a fine and get away with it. And hence, in all these damages, etc., levied by the government, there is no GST. However, on the other hand, in case of a business contract, if there is some penalty, on that, there will be GST. So, in the government case, there will be no GST and on private cases, there will be GST. Check dishonor, fine or penalty. Guys, I hope it never happens with you. But if your check bounces like this, then in that case, the bank can levy a charge. And on that, there is GST because that is not interest. Next, forfeiture of salary or payment of bond amount. Guys, you started working in an organization and the organization said that you have to work in that organization for at least three years. But you signed the bond also, but then you wanted to shift after one year. So you have to pay some amount. That amount, again, is in connection to your salary or to your employment. And hence, there is no GST on that. Late payment surcharge or fee. Guys, as you know, in a lot of cases, you need to pay on time. You bought a mobile phone, you need to pay them on time. You bought an AC, you need to pay them on time. You bought a bike from electric bike company, you need to pay them on time. And if you don't do that, then on that late payment or late fee, you know there is GST. Fixed charges for power. Now, which power are we talking about? Not the ones in the hand of politician. We are talking about electricity. As you know, electricity on the main amount, there is no GST. 
same way on the fixed amount of power up to certain units units it's fixed on that amount also there is no gst remember other than that meter rent meter repair etc there will be gst cancellation charges you booked a flight you want to cancel it now you booked a movie you want to cancel it now and cancellation charges unfortunately also there will be gst next guys insurance very unique concept in insurance if you don't make claims example if I take a health insurance, if I don't make a claim, then next year my premium gets reduced. That's called a no claim bonus. If my premium was 10,000, it became 8,000. So I got a discount of 2,000. On that, will there be GST? Of course not. The government says that's a discount. If the company does not make money, how can we make money on that? So on that, there is no GST. Next, prohibited goods. As you know, there is pita, that is pan masala, ice cream, tobacco, and aerated water. These are prohibited goods. Now they have new company. Now, prohibited goods has one more addition. It's called bricks, fly ash bricks, building bricks, earthen bricks, and tiles. And hence, I'll, and I have a new shortcut now called pita bread, B for bricks. Next, very important, and I have a prediction this will be there in your exam renting of residential property. As you know, guys, residential property has no connection to business. So, earlier this used to be completely exempt. Now, they made a small change. They said that if you're renting to an unregistered person, then we will not tax, we will not have any GST. If you are renting to a sole proprietor who is using it for residential purposes, then also we will not have any GST. In these two cases, there will be no GST. Repeating, to unregistered persons, no GST. To sole proprietors for residential purposes, no GST. But if you are renting it to anyone else, example, you are renting it to a partnership firm, LLP, or you are renting to an, an academy, PHS Academy, Pinnacle Education, etc. Then in that case, why do they want a residence? That means somewhere they're using it for business and hence there will be GST on this, which is under RCM. So our RCM shortcut, some lawyers lending cards, if you've been my student, there's a shortcut. On that, you now have to add residence. So this one is very important. And somewhere in the exam, this has really good importance now. Next, I is going for a holiday and taking a holiday to Sikkim, Arunachal Pradesh. Remember on the air flights, there was no GST, which is still true right now also. But they've just added that if you book that flight tickets, using an e-commerce operator, then on that there will be GST. Unfortunately, sad music in the background. Railway transport. You know, guys, a lot of goods are transported in railways and there are some which are exempted when they are transported. We had a shortcut called Rail Doctor Nam. What is that Rail Doctor Nam? When you're transporting railway material or defense material or relief material or newspapers or agricultural products, manure or milk, etc. Rail Doctor Nam. These used to be exempted. Now, out of that, the exemption has been removed from railway equipment. So, if you transport railway equipment through railways, there will be GST. We are already on one third of the list. Next, guys, if you are transporting goods through trucks, it used to be taxable except LL Dr. Nam. If you remember, Dr. Nam is the same. LL means low value. When the value was below 750 per consignment or below 1500, now the government has thankfully removed it. For a C and a student, I think that is good because that's two less LLs to remember. Next, guys, earlier agriculture had a lot of benefits. Also, when you were storing not just agricultural products, but even pulses, dehas pulses, cereals, uh, nuts, etc. All that used to be exempt, but the government now wants more money. So that they said that now that exemption is withdrawn. So only now if you're storing or warehousing cereals, pulses, fruits, nuts and vegetables, only this is exempt. Otherwise, nothing else is exempt. Next, fumigation in a warehouse. Again, there's an agricultural warehouse, but there's fumigated earlier that fumigation services used to be exempt. Now the government says on that there will be GST. Sad music again in the background. Saddest music now because hospital. As hospitals used to earlier have a lot of exemptions. Now one major change here. This could be in the exam as well. If your room rent is more than 5,000 rupees. Example, you go to a very luxury hospital and your room rent is more than 5,000 rupees, and the government says if you can afford such a fancy room, such beautiful nurses, such good views, then you can also pay GST. But remember that 5,000 limit does not apply to ICU rooms, ICC rooms, because those are okay even if they are more than 5,000, there will be no GST. So those are exceptions to the above 5,000 taxability. Very important, guys, this one. You're a tour operator in India. And you're giving services to a foreign tourist. Example, there's someone who's come from abroad, from US, and you are, let's say, Raj Holidays or Kesari Holidays or SOTC, and you are giving him a package of 1 lakh rupees, whereby he's going to spend two nights in Dubai and three nights in India. Now, will there be GST? Yes, but on what value? Not the entire value. They say 
You have to proportion it because it's two by three. So two by five and three by five. Two by five is abroad. So on that twenty thousand there will be no GST. But three by five that is sixty thousand there will be GST. So you have to proportion it. If it's more than twelve hours in India, then it will be considered as the whole day. Up to twelve hours, half day. Very very important. This one fumigation and room charges in a hospital. Guys, unfortunately now all hotels, whether it's below thousand up to thousand, thankfully for a C A inter student this is good. All of them have now GST. Whether any hotel room, even if it's a five hundred rupee room, even if it's a fifteen thousand rupee room, they will have GST. Food sampling, which is earlier exam, now is taxable. Animal slaughtering. Thank you so much because I am a Jain. I don't like animal slaughtering. This one is good. So animal slaughtering now has GST. RBI, IRDS, SEBI. Two very big, three very big bodies. One is for insurance. One is for banking. One is for stock markets. When they provide services now, there will be GST. Cord blood banks. Remember, in hospital, in hospitals, cord blood bank. They used to give stem cell preservation. Now that is under GST. And biomedical waste treatment, guys. A hospital produces a lot of waste. Mask, gloves, PPE kits, injections. So there used to be companies which used to uh, treat that biomedical waste. On that earlier, it used to be exempt. Now whatever they will charge, there will be GST. Now these blue ones again are exempt. I some company which is a state government undertaking wants or a public sector undertaking wants a loan, but the bank says who will give you a guarantee? So the state government gives a guarantee, and they charge a guarantee fee. And on that guarantee fee, there will be no GST. Example: Let's say a public sector undertaking wants a one thousand crore rupee loan. On that one thousand crore rupee loan, the state government has given an undertaking that they will pay. For that, they charge the PSU. On that, there will be no GST. Now, nice tolls on the highways are always without GST, and so are overloading charges. If there are overloading charges on that also at toll plazas, there will be no GST. You go to an education institution, you ask for a migration certificate. That's also part of education services only, and hence that is also exempt. Guys, a lot of people go on TV nowadays. They shout with Arnab Goswami, they match his voice levels, and they get some paid as an honorarium. That amount will be subject to GST because the government says, "Why should I exempt it?" Next one is very very important, guys. There's a mistake here. Please change it. IVF treatment. Guys, IVF is basically a, a artificial way of getting pregnant uh, through this also called test tube baby. That IVF treatment is a hospitalization procedure and will be exempt from GST. Rule thirty six four has been removed. What is this rule, guys? Earlier, if you are buying something from a supplier and you are taking credit, the supplier had to upload the invoice. If he does not upload the invoice, you don't get credit, or you would get twenty five, twenty, fifteen, ten, five. Now all that has been removed. So if he does not upload the invoice. Unfortunately, sorry, sorry, sorry. You will not get any credit. Very important change. As you are taking credit, yes, for this year, your year is twenty two twenty three. But for some reason, you are unable to take it in this year. Then can you take it ahead? Yes, there is an expiry. That expiry now has changed. They say in the next year, there are two dates, A and B. Whichever is earlier, maximum by then you can take the credit to the credit ledger. Remember, guys, I'm not talking about the time period to use the credit. There is no time period to use the credit. The credit can be used forever, but to take it to the credit ledger, there is a time period. Now, what is the time period? Shortcut is N A. N is thirtieth November. That is N. This date is fixed. Yes, or annual return filing date. Remember, in GST, you need to file an annual return whenever you file it, not the due date. Whenever you file it, that date. So N A is the shortcut. N for November. A for annual return. Now, if the annual return is filed on fifteen September, then fifteen September. If it's filed on fifteen December, then thirtieth November will be the due date. Rule thirty-seven A, brand new rule. Let's see what this rule is talking. Guys, you are a buyer. You are EBC. You have bought some batteries from battery supply company. They have uploaded the details in their GSTR one. You have taken the credit because purchase leads to credit. Life is good. Let's say the credit is twelve thousand rupees, and you've taken it. Now, battery supply company has to, without besides filing the GSTR one, they also have to file GSTR three B, and pay the GST to the government. The government says, listen, if battery supply company does not pay us after the year, even till thirtieth September, we will wait. But if they don't pay us till then, then whatever you have taken has to be reversed by thirtieth November. Remember. 
they have to pay by 30th September, else you will have to re 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 reverse it by 30th November. And if you don't do it, you will have to pay interest at the rate of 18%. So they are punishing you again, yes, because of something wrong. They are doing, yes. This rule 37A again is very, very important. Revise it again. This is on payment of GST to the government. Next. Earlier, guys, if you remember, your GST registration could get cancelled. There were six reasons. Uh, can immediately commence 36 frauds. And in that, three and six were if you have not filed your return for three periods for composition scheme, guys. Now that three periods has changed. They say now if a composition scheme dealer has not filed his return for three months. So April is a due date. If you don't file it for three months after that, then your registration can get cancelled. E-invoice it electronic invoicing whereby you go on a portal and you make an invoice that now is applicable for everyone whose turnover was up to 10 crores sorry whose turnover is more than 10 crores since 1718 this has been reducing it was earlier 100 then it became 50 then 20 now it's become 10 for your exam remember this however guys dynamic qr code and all still remains at 500 crore limit the time limit for issuing credit notes guys credit notes the government does not like where because here the GST amount reduces. Now, in this case, they say that credit note for a particular year cannot be issued forever. You can issue credit note only up to a certain expiry, which is the same as NA, which is discussed here. Next, section 50. Guys, in section 50, you have not paid your GST on time. You had to pay a GST by 20th. You paid it on 24th. So there's four day delay. They would charge you interest at the rate of 18%. And sometimes if you unnecessarily reduce your liability or unnecessarily exceed, uh, increase your uh, credit, they would charge you interest at 24%, which right now they've reduced to 18%. We'll understand the logic when we understand penalties chapter at CA final. Next, Rule 88B. Guys, this is rule, something that you already know. If I'm supposed to pay 1 lakh GST, this is my liability to the government. And out of that, I have already have credit of 60,000. Then I basically need to pay only 40,000 in cash to the government. This is something that you and me already know. Now the government has only put a rule saying that this rule is not important. Sorry, I marked it important, but it's not important. It only says that if you've not filed your return. Example, this return is supposed to be filed on 20th October and you're filing it on 24th October. That is a small delay. Then for the four days, we will be charging you interest at 18%, but only on this net amount. So what is the shortcut here? If you've not filed your return, then you will pay on the net amount. But let's say you filed your return, guys. Everything is good. You filed your return on 20th October. You paid the 40,000 rupees. But in December 15th, you figured that for the month of September, that there was some liability which you had missed out and you are paying that liability now. So in this case, has the return been filed? Yes. So now that you're filing your, uh, now that return has already been filed and now that you have to pay some extra amount, the government says, here we will tax you as interest on this entire 18,000, not after credit. So shortcut, if you have not filed your return, like in this first case, you will pay on the net amount. And if you filed your return, like in the second case, then you will pay on the gross amount. GSTR 2B. Guys, nowadays, there are GSTR 2A and 2B. What does this mean? I bought some batteries from battery supply company. Here am I. I'm EBC and I bought some batteries from battery supply company. When they file their GSTR 1, it gets auto-populated in my GSTR 2A. Now that 2A will... Uh, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. Once it's finalized, it'll get into a auto-populated GSTR 2B on the basis of which I can take credit. So don't worry, not very important. But 2A and 2B both have similar purpose. They are basically indicating you how much you purchase and how much credit you can take. Remember in the exam, you can take only that much credit which is reflecting in your GSTR 2B. Now the last two guys, section 47. You've not filed your handle return. It is supposed to be filed by 31st December. You've not filed it and there's a late fee. Yes, there's a late fee. Earlier, the late fee used to be 100 rupees per day uh, or some percentage of turnover. Now they've changed it depending on your turnover. If your turnover is low, that is up to 5 crore, then you have to pay only 50 rupees per day or 0.04% of your turnover. Yes, you heard it right. So 5 and 4 is a shortcut here. If your turnover is more than 5 crore, but up to 20 crore rupees, then you have to pay 100 rupees per day or 0.04. So this is 1.4, this is 5.4. But if your turnover is more than 20 crores, then why did you not file your return? The penalty is 200 per day or 0.5 of the turnover. This you have to buy hard. There is no option. So 5 by 4, 1 by 4 and 2 by 5. This is how you will remember it. 
If not, then remember 0 0.04, 0 0.04 common, 0 0.5 here because the turnover is high and here is 50, 100 and 200 per day. Not very important, I feel, because these late fees keep changing so much. I don't think the government wants you to know these late fees. But still, keep this in mind, especially the annual return. And last, a very, very important return or a rule called Rule 88C. This could be in the exam, guys, but it's a very simple rule. Guys, this is Battery Supply Company. In their GSTR 1, that is the statement of outward supplies, they have said that they have supplied batteries worth 1 lakh on which GST is 12,000. So they are saying that they have supplied batteries worth 1 lakh, GST 12,000. But while filing their GSTR 3B, they very conveniently showed sales of only 90,000 on and that they have paid GST only of 10,000. Now the government sees a mismatch of 2,000 rupees. So this is rule 88C in which the taxpayer will be told about this difference in liability in GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. You will be given seven days to either explain the difference or to pay the difference. And if you don't, then they can chase you. So this is basically rule 88C, which only identifies the difference between a GSTR 1 and GSTR 3B. Honestly, guys, this is the amendment list of GST of GST uh, for November 23 exams. Watch it once, watch it again. And best time to watch it is every time you finish your portion from wherever you're doing it, my book, any other classes, etc. Watch this amendment video to revise this GST amendment. All the best and see you at the other side of CA Inter.